Hey guys, I'm John and welcome to Respect Your Intellect. Believe it or not, there are people out there that deny that gravity exists and those people are most often flat earthers. They claim that if gravity is strong enough to hold oceans in place, then butterflies, small as they are, shouldn't be able to overcome that force. So in today's video, we're going to be addressing that using actual science. Let's get started. The first thing to know about forces is that there are only four fundamental forces the strong and weak nuclear forces, the electromagnetic force, and gravity. Every other force like friction, lift, and drag, for example, are non-fundamental forces and have to be explained by the interactions of fundamental forces. These four fundamental forces also have very different ranges and strengths attached to them. Gravity is by far the weakest of all the forces at the atomic level, but its range allows it to affect objects over great distances. Since gravity is also related to the mass of objects, it becomes by far the strongest fundamental force at planetary scales and distances just because of sheer mass and size. The way that gravity works is that mass increases the gravitational pull while increasing distance reduces it. Now to understand how different things can react differently to gravity, we need to talk about the surface area and the volume of an object. As objects grow in size, the surface area and volume do not increase proportionally. The volume grows much more quickly than the surface area does and this is called the square cube law or surface area to volume ratio. Here's an example with cubes that have different lengths for their sides. If we start with a cube that has sides of one centimeter, it gives us a surface area of six square centimeters with one cubic centimeter of volume. So the amount of surface area here is six times higher than the volume. Now for a five centimeter cube, we now have 150 square centimeters of surface area and 125 cubic centimeters of volume. So the volume is already almost caught up. If we go further to a 10 centimeter cube, we're up to 600 square centimeters of surface area and 1000 cubic centimeters of volume. So now the volume is already almost double the surface area. If we push it even further to a 100 centimeter cube, we get 60,000 square centimeters of surface area and 1 million cubic centimeters of volume, which is now up to more than 16 times the surface area. What's also important to remember here is that for living things, bigger volume generally means bigger mass as well. So if we were to take an insect, a mouse, a dog, and an elephant to the top of a very high building, we would get very very different results if we were to drop each of them. The insect would not even really be affected in any way from the fall, so it's essentially impervious to the effects of gravity. The mouse would be a bit stunned as it hit the ground, but it would be able to just shrug it off and continue on its merry way. The dog, however, would basically get squashed under its own weight, and the elephant would literally explode everywhere, so for them, it's the end. The reason why I make this pretty gruesome example is that it's easy to remember and it illustrates well how the square cube law works. Here's a quick question for you that you can pause and try to answer. If you were to remove the air from a chamber so that there is no air resistance and drop a brick and a feather, what do you think will touch the ground first? Well, the answer to that is that they would touch the ground at exactly the same time. Earth's gravity pulls every object towards the ground at the same rate of acceleration, regardless of their mass or size. However, when you add air and perform the same experiment, you're introducing the concept of terminal velocity. When an object is falling in air, there will be air resistance on the way down, and this will act against gravity and gradually slow the gravitational acceleration. When gravity and air resistance are balanced, there's no more acceleration acceleration, so the object is said to have reached its terminal velocity and the speed stabilizes. In the case of a feather, the balance between gravity and air resistance is achieved very quickly, so the acceleration stops and it just continues to fall at the same slow rate. In the case of butterflies, even if they didn't try to fly and were simply dropped, they'd have much more in common with the feather than the brick. So you can probably start seeing at this point how easy it is for butterflies to overcome the gravitational pull. Their terminal velocity is very slow, like a feather, and their mass is very small compared to their surface area, so a simple flap of the wings can easily apply enough lift for them to stay up. 
With bigger flying animals like birds, their wingspan has to be larger and larger in relation to their mass according to the square cube law to allow for flight. Here's an example of a pigeon in flight. Note that the wingspan is not very large on this bird because their mass is still pretty small, but it's enough for them to fly well. Here's an example of a chicken's wingspan. As you can see here, their wingspan is not large enough to allow for flight with their mass, so the only thing they can do is use them to slow their fall or jump a bit higher. Their wings are just not large enough to allow them to create enough force to counter the pull of gravity. And here's an example of an eagle. This eagle is similar in weight to the chicken, but notice how large the wingspan has to be in comparison to the others to allow them to fly well. These birds all fly with a lift force created by lower air pressure at the top of a wing compared to below it, in the same way that our airplanes are designed. When you get to even smaller insects like fruit flies, then the air density feels much thicker, so they feel it about the same as we feel water. What this means is that these small insects are not really flying through the air, they're actually swimming through it. Studies show that their wing movements have much more in common with paddling in a kayak than it does with the other birds that we just talked about. These small insects use the force of drag, which is a type of friction where you use the medium to push yourself forward, just like when you go swimming. With all that said, we still need to talk about how the oceans stay down. Well, this is much simpler, since oceans don't exert any force to counter gravity. Even if you were to drop an entire ocean from a high altitude, it doesn't really matter how fast it would fall, because there's nothing that an ocean can do to counter that pull, so it will always end up on the ground. So as you can see, when you break it down, it's not very complicated. The smaller you are, the less massive you are in proportion to your surface area, so your terminal velocity will be slower, which means that less force is necessary to overcome gravity. As for anything that doesn't exert any force to counter gravity, then everything will simply settle based on their density, with a higher pressure towards the center of the Earth. Considering that this takes only a few minutes to research and learn, and that some flat earthers essentially swear by this statement, it literally just seems to me like Flat Earth is a contest of who can appear the least educated for the longest amount of time. I don't think that's something to be proud of. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. If you like this video and want more, be sure to subscribe and hit that thumbs up. You can also find links to my Twitter and Facebook in the description if you want to chat with me there. Until next time, thanks for watching and remember, respect your intellect.